name is Peter Brogan. I'm doing a PhD in geography at York University in Toronto, looking at basically transformations in, in urban space and capitalism, and really trying to understand the question of why the attacks on teachers, their unions, and, and the kind of dismantling of public education and creating a privatized, corporatized system has been really kind of central to like, larger transformations in the global political so that is that is to say, like, why why is it so important right now for Rahm Emanuel to be attacking the Chicago Teachers Union? Why you know why is it at the center of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party's political political agenda to basically dismantle the institution of public education uh, and and kind of put in its place a hybrid, largely privatized corporate form? And part of that is really trying to understand why why they're fighting to produce the the city in a particular way, and how that how that's relating to the kind of wider structural crisis of capitalism, really beginning at least my my own research is, is focused on kind of the the crisis of profitability and, and capital that comes out of the seventies, and the kind of ushering in of neoliberalism with the attacks on unions and kind of workers and working class living standards, and really designing the city in a particular way. So. What I want to do today, I sent out a, an article that I have, it's being reviewed from a Canadian journal, and the title of that is Education in the Global City and the Remaking of Contemporary Capitalism. I'm not going to read the piece, you guys have it, you can look at it. What I essentially want to do though is try to get at that main question of why, you know, why is the attack on public education so, so fundamental, you know, not just not just for the right, but actually for the broader ruling class in this country and globally, dealing with the structural crisis of capitalism at this kind of critical juncture. And why, at that center of that, destroying the unions, and teachers' unions in particular, has been key to that, that piece. For the past 20, 30 years, teachers have been really under attack, beginning in the 80s, and it was framed from, from 1988 on basically at a federal level as a crisis of national security. And things I want to tease out from this question of understanding, you know, why, again, the attack is so vital, right, is like, why, like, teachers and public education is a vital sector for socialist transformation? And why organizing amongst education workers is not just organizing other workers, right? Because I think there's a tendency on the, I think, in the left to treat it as a kind of another, just another economistic fight. And I think what the, the major value of what the CTU and the leadership of course is doing is showing us a different way for that. And, and actually, if you, we have any hope of pushing back against the neoliberal attack on public education and teachers and their unions, we actually need to frame that as a much broader struggle of social justice, not just in kind of economistic terms of wages, benefits, and so on. Although that is vital to how the kind of schools we create in the broader society, right? So. Just to kind of step back, pieces of my research or my argument that I wanted to kind of lay out here is that the kind of wider restructuring began really in the global south, and it was driven again under General Pinochet, Chile, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa and other countries from the 70s on. And although it seems as extreme as can get in the United States right now, it, it's not the case. And we can, I mean, there's all kinds of really interesting historical examples of how this has happened, but I just want to focus on how it's materialized here in Chicago because I think that's vital. So in the, for the past um, 17 years, at least since 1995, with the reforms under Delhi and kind of uh, creation of mayoral control, you see this kind of layering of and kind of innovative neoliberal policy in the city, really undermining any kind of democratic notion of public control of the schools. And I think that's driven by two chief things, capitalist accumulation and the desire to kind of expand into the public education sector, but also the white supremacy and a kind of restructuring of state power to manage poor black and brown people in the city in a very particular way. Because this is also part of the larger structural crisis of capitalism. How do you deal with a kind of surplus humanity that's not just keeping wages down anymore, but it is actually a real political problem Levels, right? So I think the you know the destruction of public housing and the destruction of public schools even more more so has been kind of key to that. And as a kind of an arena of economic investment and capital accumulation, like 
the global market for educational services is tremendous. $2.5 trillion uh, estimated as of last year. And in the US, it's you know, close to $600 billion that, that they're looking to get their hands on, right? This is why you have what, what's called these venture philanthropists, most prominently the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Eli Brood Foundation, and the Walton Foundation uh, pushing this. But beyond that, you know, it's a, it's, it is a really important arena for economic investment and capitalist accumulation. You know, the World Bank has been saying, at least since 1997, um, and I think this is part of the larger reason why you have hedge funds and, and Walton and so on, beyond kind of ideological reasons, that there are no good jobs being created around the world, right? They're all very low-end, shitty service sector jobs. So if that's the case, why are we going to spend the bulk of the money in education expenditure on professional teachers, right? Because that is, you know, we often don't want to admit it, but that the bulk of the money actually does go to pay teachers. Uh, especially in the U.S., and that's a good thing, right? Because they are—they're the the most important facets of the system, I think. Um, but there are other factors, right? So it, it's that recognition that the labor market globally, and and in the U.S. in particular, has been restructured in such a way around this kind of a service sector and you know really very little manufacturing work, especially in a global city like Chicago. That's, that's really based on a service, knowledge, sector, economy, that they, there are going to be a need to create educational opportunities for some folks to actually rise into those, those the knowledge creative industries. But by and large, like most people are being trained for shitty uh, service sector employment, as I said. So th that, that kind of larger economic imperative beyond kind of making more and more money in the industry and, and creating those jobs is, is kind of what's driving in part the attacks on the teachers and unions. The second piece I want to say about what what else is driving is that, you know, what this idea of a global city, I want to just talk about that briefly, because people from Rahm Emanuel on to the mayor of Bloomberg in New York uh, use that term all the time, but in a very kind of boosterous way. You know, we're going to get the Olympics, we're going to get, you know, bring a form like NATO into town and really, you know, show how incredibly uh, cosmopolitan we are. And, and that's, not, that's not the kind of uh, like meaning I'm trying to get to the global city. What I and other critical urban scholars have, have been writing about, for the, starting really with Saskia Assassin and some other geographers prior to her, is, is to say that you know, the transformation of global capitalism since the 70s has meant that some cities have been pushed to the center. You know, Tokyo, London, LA, Chicago, New York, and then others are on the margins. And at the center of that, you have cities that are really the kind of financial nerve centers and, and kind of the power centers of global capitalism, where you have the most vital, important financial markets, but also like, you know, politically, in terms of where transnational corporations are located, where, where they're making decisions. And, and f because of that, right, they look to cities like Chicago and New York as really unique centers for developing experiments in restructuring governance and really pushing a corporate, private, entrepreneurial model in, in how we govern education, how we govern housing, injecting competitiveness into everything and standardizing everything. So that's on the one hand, right? And I, I think that also, part of my research has been trying to understand, you know, if a city like Chicago as a global city, as this nerve center of global capitalism, has such importance for the ruling class to kind of restructure policies and so on, might it also have a really significant influence for a work class struggle? And I feel like if, if people have been opening newspapers every day, like here, you see, like, every, it's kind of amazing that every day, like, front page, pretty much, or the second page, the struggle of the teachers. And, and nationally, like, people, I mean, I have about seven pages of quotes from the Socialist Worker to the Chicago Sun Times or the Wall Street Journal, where basically, they're saying what's happening right now in Chicago around the teachers is, you know, historical, national significance. And, and they're right to the extent that no other union is pushing back. And, and it will, even in a small way, if the CTU is able to push back against the advanced agenda of corporatizing and further demolishing public schools, like that will have a huge effect nationally and globally against the project of. Uh, of neoliberalism and education. But 
more to the point, it actually has like how how a city is physically and socially built and what it's for. Like I think is is pretty key, and I think you see that in, in a lot of the materials being put out by the CTU is that this really is not just a fight over you know not just the schools itself, but what kind of city we want to live in, and that and that's really actually what kind of city do we want to build. And, they have amazing researchers. They didn't have a research department prior to CORE coming to office, but they've actually mapped out like how foreclosures have, has kind of mapped onto gentrification patterns and the closing of schools, right? And they, they have a very kind of explicit, spatial, geographical way of understanding these, these radical changes. So that, I think, you know, is why, one of the reasons why the fight here in Chicago is really important. The other piece I want to say is that Teachers are the best organized, most highly unionized workers in all of the U.S. and globally. There's about five million teachers organized between the NEA and the AFT. The point being, like, teachers organizationally are, there's a huge number that aren't unions, and that's a huge potential roadblock, not just for the kind of steamrolling public education, privatizing the whole system, but actually, you know, in the global city where the contradictions of capitalism and inequality and, and racial oppression are really most intense. And you know, in Chicago you can really feel that if you if you traverse the neighborhood in, in kind of any given day. You know, you have to really destroy any potential opposition. And I think the teachers unions itself, even you know, the bulk of which are, are very collaborative and, and kind of business oriented and, and don't have any interest unlike what the CTU has done on their core actually mobilizing their membership, much less building a, a broader struggle for social, radical social transformation, I think it has huge political potential. Just to kind of summarize what I'm trying to say is like there's this huge kind of economic imperative to why the ruling class in the U.S. and globally is attacking teachers and trying to restructure public education. That's really important, but there's also huge there's this huge political piece, right, especially in large metropolitan areas from New York to Chicago and elsewhere, right? and L.A. is another really important case. But attached to that, too, I think we need to say, and I don't think we do as a left uh, say this enough, that like teaching is ideological, cultural work. Like, and schools, typically in most capitalist formations, have played a role in what Althusser called this ideological state apparatus in reproducing capitalism and hegemonic social relations, uh, dominant class values, and so on. That's true, but if we turn to somebody like Gramsci, and, and even out this to some extent, schools have also served as like sites for radical contestation of all those things. And that possibility exists in a public system where it won't exist in a privatized system. So while it's true, like, and as Marxists and socialists, we need to say, like, schools have and do, in many instances, play very, very oppressive roles in reproducing these kind of wider inequitable relations of capitalism. They also, when they're public, hold that, that hope of educating democratic critical subjects. And historically, that's been a completely racialized, gendered, and geographically uneven process how this worked. So that you can get somebody like Diane Rabich, who was a leading kind of proponent of, of neoconservative education reform, and, and wrote many books blasting the leftists for their, this kind of same critique, um, and who has now become like a, a really a, a, an amazing critic of what's happening. She has this notion like there was a golden age in American education where you could get that great education, and she and she did, <laughs> and some people did, but if you were white and you lived in a middle class neighborhood, and you know. Um, but historically, it's been very inequitable, right? So that, that's the other piece. Like, in terms of that kind of attacking, you know, recognizing the real subversive role that teachers can play, right, to, to kind of bring a sense of the wider injustice of capitalism. And, and so to give students the tools to understand the world and then also to engage in the kind of activity to contest it in the school and outside. That's, a, that's another political piece that I think we need to really discuss, and I want to just maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end on that note, um, and and maybe with a couple questions and say, yeah, just how do we how do we advance? What do people think in terms of what the CTU has been doing on the core, and and just this 
this last piece, because I think that's the one that we tend to neglect, especially as people who might just be coming to look and be, you know, really pay attention to what's happening with teachers and in education. You know, but this, I, I really think it'd be a mistake to just look at it as like, just, just another public sector kind of struggle that we should get behind because we have some people in there, there at the forefront. It's not just that. Like, if we can, if we could push back and then actually not just push to defend public schools, which I think we need to do, because they, they do hold that radical emancipatory potential, but advance a more kind of radical uh, analysis and movement around like, what's being taught, you know? And as much as I, I think it's incredible the kind of analysis that, that the CTU has done around you know, the, the school Chicago students deserve, like, at the end of the day, it does say not a lot about what actually is taught, what, what the curriculum is. So calls for a richer curriculum, you know, for world languages and art and, and music and, and so forth, but it doesn't really challenge kind of like how, how classroom instruction is done or kind of the wider inequitable realities of capitalist society, right? And that's, I think we need to keep that in mind and, and be very careful as we build our movements around uh, fighting for education that we don't just fall into this kind of liberal trap of like just defending the liberal idea of education that is the kind of great leveler, right? Because that plays a huge ideological role in containing working class struggle, I think is, in, you know, the kind of, you just advance up the ladder of mediocrity. If, but if we have all equitable access to education, which is very important and we should fight for that, it's still not going to change necessarily the realities of uh, existence in the U.S., right? So, anyway, I just maybe leave it there.